Hi, I'm Becky Mayer and welcome to Transitions Body, Mind, Spirit. Transitions, we have so many different transitions in our life. We're in elementary school and we think we're going to grow up and be a fireman or something and then they end up doing totally, maybe you become a dancer. Uh, I just find it very interesting that uh, we all have different paths and I like to use the metaphor of triathlons, something I did three sprints this summer, matter of fact. In a triathlon, the first thing you do is you swim. And after you swim, then you go in the transition area, things change, you get on the bicycle, and then after you bike, you transition again and start the run. And that's just a metaphor for how things happen in our life. And we have a very, very fascinating guest today who is going to be uh, talking about his life. I can say that he is an entrepreneur, He's a, a, an artist, everything from stained glass to uh, furniture. It's absolutely fascinating. And I want to welcome our guest, Bill Brim. Thank Bill, you. welcome. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Yes. Now, we're going to be showing during our, um, our show actually examples of your, your current work and some of your past work uh, as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I know for 30 some years you did stained glass also. But I want to go back to your childhood, where you were born okay. and uh, what it was like growing up. And uh, um, so tell us about where you were born. Okay, born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. In Madison? Madison, yes. 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 And was born, my father was a, a coach, football coach, educator. I think my, he's kind of famous too, isn't he? Yes, he's in the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, actually. And his name? Bill Brim. Bill Brim. Yeah. Right. You were a junior? Junior. Okay. Yes. All right. So you grew up, your dad was a football coach. Correct. And coached yeah. sports. Yeah. And your mama? A homemaker. Okay. Which I don't know if people even use that term anymore, do they? <laughs> they might, yeah. Stayed home, watched it's very, you. It sounds very old-fashioned. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so growing up as a kid, did you have, was your dad trying to make you more of a sports fan, but you became more of an artist as a child? What was happening? Uh, as a child, I was very creative, hmm. working puzzles, drawing, Playing in the sand pile, building a tree house. Mm. And then as I got a little bit older, you would have to play sports in the backyard with the neighborhood boys. So I tried that. I did it, but I sucked. <laughs> uh, you didn't feel real good about yeah, playing sports. And, you know, I, my father thought it was my destiny to, to be a sports, be a jock. Wow. At least that's what he wanted, yeah. you know. So, yeah. but I wasn't. I tried and it didn't work out. You did try. I did try. Yes, but okay, so the, you're, let's say you're in high school and that's kind of when you have an opportunity to blossom in your art world. How did that transform? Uh, well, I just started taking art classes in public school and, mm -hmm. you know, it just, I was a good fit. It just made me feel whole. Mm. So, uh, so anyway, through uh, junior high school and high school, I took art classes, took a shop class, woodworking class. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I graduated from high school, I went to MTSU and was an art major. Okay, so you, you graduated from MTSU in art? I did, yes. Okay, and did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Not at that point, just mm -hmm. create. That's all I knew. Just create. I, I really didn't have an idea of, okay, this is how I'm going to make a living, you know. <laughs> it can be a very difficult um, profession to make a living at. Yeah, that's what they all say. Yeah. Your parents always say that. Starving artist. Yes. Uh, right. And so you graduated and then uh, you got married, I believe? I did. Uh, I met my ex-wife, I think my junior year in college. Mm -hmm. And we started dating, and then we got married my senior year. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, well, I guess I was 24, and she had a son, a four-year-old. So he was four when we got married. And I loved him dearly. And uh, anyway, after graduation, we moved to Ventura, California, where she was raised. Okay, and, her hometown. Yeah. Yeah. And at that time, you know, I just needed a job. So I substitute taught mm -hmm. in public schools and was a bartender and started taking stained glass courses. That's where stained glass courses yes. came in. Wow, and when you started taking stained glass, how did you think, oh, I wanna make this a big business? Or At how? that time, uh, again, I, had, I don't know. I just knew I wanted to do it. I love how the, the sunlight comes through the glass and creates this whole ambiance in a room. And mm. uh, yeah, it's just a, a beautiful medium, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did that. And uh, then a, after a couple of years, we moved back to Nashville. And mm -hmm. there was a stained glass studio, a manual stained glass studio on 16th Avenue next to uh, it used to be Cornania, I think. It was like a okay. Christian bookstore. Okay. Anyway, uh, I had heard about it, so I just went in and said, I want to work here. You just, well, I want to work here. Okay. And I met my dear friend Dennis Harmon at that time. And uh, he, had, you know, at that time he was still doing, I would say a lot of, quite a bit of residential and then getting into the ecclesiastical work was uh, churches. his goal, yes, yes. Okay, his goal was to get into churches. Right. And he wasn't, but you but, came on the scene. You know, he was kind of, in the beginning, self-taught and started the business, and it was coming around. It was... Uh, mm -hmm. So I got a job there. And, and initially you got the job and that uh, you started doing churches, big, and when I think of churches, I think that's a lot of stained glass. Yeah. I mean, that is a major deal, right? Yes. Uh, we did, all of it was commission work, so it wasn't like they would come in and buy something for their mm -hmm. building. Um, but we did a lot of contemporary stuff, uh, traditional with, Jesus come unto me and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. was it all Christian? We did one Jewish building. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And on West End. Okay. Yes. So you were doing churches, stained glass, and you physically were doing the stained glass, right? But then that I was. started to morph into something it else. It did as as the business grew. Uh, hiring more employees so they could do the work. So I would say the last 15 years, it was really more of a desk job. It was, you know, scheduling and making sure the employees do their work correctly, their craftsmanship is good, and uh, doing QuickBooks and, Accounting. you know, finding an insurance agent that'll give us a good deal, you know, that kind of stuff, so. Yeah, the business thing. Yeah. And it, did you start to realize that, hey, I'm doing business stuff, but I'm not creating? Right, not enough, not enough. Mm -hmm. It was, um, you know, if we got really backed up and behind, I was just like, okay, I'm, I'll go out there and jump in. It was really fun. So. Okay. <laughs> so you had the stained glass business for like 36 years? About? Yeah, I came in. After a few years of working for Dennis, I came in as a partner, mm -hmm. and I was there 36, 37 years. Wow, wow. But you told me that toward the end of that, that period, you were starting to uh, do some artistic things on the weekends. Right. Back in uh, probably around 93. I decided that I, I just needed to do something on the weekends that was just my art, no one else's. 
what you wanted. Right. You weren't commissioned to do right, it. Right. It's like, I want to do this. So, and then I, I got the idea, I want to make some tables with leaded glass tops. Mm. And uh, so I started doing that in the basement. But there was one problem. I needed metal, you know, structures to, to put, put the that glass, glass on. on. Right. So I had to teach myself to weld. Oh, you taught yourself? I did, uh, from a video. I, what I tried to do was ah. just, there's a vocational school just a block from here. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'll go there and, and learn how to weld. So it was a night class and I get there and there are a lot of people, you know, just out of high school. Mm -hmm. So it's very strict. You have got to be here at this time and, you know, stay to th this long. And I'm just going, I can't do this. <laughs> All that structure. <laughs> yeah, the structure. Yeah, so, so I taught myself, and that uh, that developed into my first experience in showing in a gallery. Um, my uh, first place I showed was local color gallery. Ron York, the owner, he mm. gave me my first chance to show at, your to artwork show in a gallery. Yes, so, and that uh, was your furniture. Yes. Okay, and I think we have some pictures here. Yeah. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so tell us about this. Uh, it's a coffee table. Coffee table? Yes. And uh, so as you see, it has metal legs and I had to create the, create the triangle for which to accommodate that design. Mm -hmm. And uh, in and the in blue? that particular table, I actually uh, cut a piece of plate glass to lay on top of it so it would be a smooth surface mm. for, you know, setting drinks or mm -hmm. coffee table books, whatever. It is really gorgeous. And how Thank big you. was this? Ooh. Three feet? We're maybe? talking <laughs> uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, let's About. see. I would say probably four feet from the front edge, the front corner to the back. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. And then I have another um, one of your pieces of furniture, which I find really yeah. very cool. Tell yeah. us about this furniture. As my work evolved, I got away from the glass and started using found objects like the auger you'll see on, on the left a side. Auger? Yeah, on the left side. Okay. And uh, what's that thing that in the middle? Thing in the middle is uh, poured concrete. Concrete. And the wood, the perimeter of the concrete is wood that uh, came out of a church we were working on. Because if we did restoration work, mm -hmm. uh, usually the sashes were rotten and the windows were sagging, and so we'd have all these old sashes left over, so uh, I would mm. use those, uh, recycle them. Wow. Yeah. So there you are making furniture on your time, mm -hmm. enjoying it, and time goes on and you're um, 36 years into this business and somehow or other you had the courage to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. Right. Uh, I think I was 63 or 4 and just, I was ready to retire. I just wanted to work in my home studio and see what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened. Oh, and then COVID happened. Wow. So. Now, at the same time, you started working on a film, right? Correct. That, I think we started that six years ago and okay. took about three years to complete. And tell us what film, what's the name of the film and what the subject was. Okay, the name or of the is. film is Invisible. And it's Say about that again? Invisible. Invisible, okay. Gay Women in Southern Music. Gay Women in Southern Music. It's a, an idea I had probably a, over a decade ago. Hmm. And having no film background, I just thought, that's just great. But, you know. Somebody oh. else would do it, right? Yeah, yeah I was willing just to give someone the idea. I thought it was such a good idea, but mm -hmm. that's not what, exactly how it worked out. So I ran it, um, the idea by a friend, 
uh, that was new to Nashville. He was a graduate of NYU Film School mm. and uh, T.J. Parcell. And he thought it was a great idea. I think we were having mm. coffee. I said, you know, I've got this idea. And three weeks later, we were interviewing Mary Gaucher. Wow. See, I was uh, fortunate enough to, some of these women have been my friends for decades, so I had an in, you oh. know, and I could, they hadn't, I had their trust, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. and, and was it difficult, I mean, had they been like in the closet or they were out saying, uh, hey, I'm a lesbian? A lot of them hid. Okay. Right. But Mary, she just, she was, she's Mary, you know, she never tried to hide, but she didn't come to Nashville until she was 40 years old and get into the music business. And it was Mary? Gaucher. Gaucher, okay. But a, uh, one of the women, she started writing back in late 70s. She came to Nashville, hooked up with uh, Dennis Morgan, a songwriter, and they wrote, they had five songs on Barbara Mandrell's album within six months. Wow, the hit songwriter. So, so anyway, there's so much history with all the women, I don't have time to tell you, but that gives mm -hmm. you an idea. Mm -hmm. And then bit by bit you put it together, but it, it, and it took years to, to get the film finished. Three years to finish it. And then how many festivals was it in? Uh, we, between the short film that we did and the feature film we showed in 57 festivals around the world. 57 festivals, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we won 18 audience and jury awards. So it's really something to be proud of. That yeah. is yeah. really something to be proud of. And I know it was shown, because I taped it, uh, on Channel 8 locally here. And then it's kind of like, dead in the water right it now. It is. Uh, I think the biggest issue is the music rights. There's, uh, we've got like 45 songs in the film. So, you mm. know, the smaller distributors, they're not willing to put that money up front. So, mm -hmm. we'll see. So, you, you got the filmmaker thing going on, and then you are doing um, a different kind of art, and that's where, what I want to get into now. I have, uh, we'll be showing it uh, for the folks at home, but um, let's talk about this and the music that inspires. Yes. Now, you can tell us what this is, and it was in, inspired by a okay. musical thing, and I believe you have some Something to okay. say about that. Yes. Uh, the latest body of work I'm doing is all music inspired. And a lot of them are hand cut collages, and mm. which that is. And, uh, you know, I just listen to the songs and I hear the lyrics and these images start popping into my head. Mm -hmm. And there you go. And you were going to read some? Yes. Um, just to give a brief explanation of the meaning of this. My church and my country could use a little mercy now. As they sink into a poison pit, it's going to take forever to climb out. They carry the weight of the faithful who follow them down. I love my church and my country. They could use some mercy now. Uh, every living thing could use a little mercy now. Only the hand of grace can end the race towards another mushroom cloud. People mm. in power, they'll do anything to keep their crown. I love life, and life itself could use some mercy now. Wow. Wow. And this is a collage, meaning there's different pieces. How do you explain a collage? Pieces of paper? Uh, it's, uh, uh, paper, yeah, most of that. Uh, there are a few wood pieces on it, the, mm -hmm. uh, the pawns, mm -hmm. so. Okay, all right. And then we have another very interesting work of art here. Ah, uh, that's inspired by Grant Wood's American Gothic. <sighs> and I call it an American portrait, faith, firearms, and fraud. And as you can see, there's 
the rifle instead of a pitchfork. Mm. And uh, I've sort of made the house, but the Gothic window look more like a church mm -hmm. by putting the cross on it because, you know, that's what it's about. It's about religion and gun violence. Mm -hmm. it, are you stating your opinion in this? Or this is just, somebody can interpret it how they may? Uh, I think the uh, gun violence in our country is out of control and, mm -hmm. and so I don't condone it at all. Yeah, yeah, and this is an, a work of art showing that. Yes. Yeah, I like it, Thank I you. like it. Okay, and then um, <laughs> I know this is our, our uh, uh, a favorite of our crew here. What uh, is this? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my fun ones. Um, that's called Bigotry is a Drag. And I finished that piece a couple of weeks before the Tennessee legislature passed the drag bill. And the drag the, bill was? Uh, basically outlawing drag performances in public. Okay. And you know, they had the drag story hour where they would read to children. And that was, a, you know, but eventually it was overturned, the, mm -hmm. uh, the drag bill. But it's, it's kind of set up in a Wizard of Oz scene. There's the yellow brick road on the right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, the fern, the, I took it from a still from the film. So there were ferns there. And instead of Dorothy's ruby slippers, there are uh, size 13 pumps <laughs> with male sock forms stuck in them. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. So. Wow, crime scene do not cross. Yeah. Wow, it's uh, I've seen this live and it's a, it's really it, it's really it's amazing. Okay, and uh, one of my favorites is this. Holy trap. Mm. Yes. Um, I had created a piece out of uh, an assemblage out of things I had around my studio, which included an old rat trap and a Madonna and child painting. And, you know, once I completed it, uh, I was just like, I love this rat trap idea. So I came up with that idea, went to Home Depot, filled up my cart with 34 rat traps. 34 went traps, real yes. traps. Yes. Wow. And I went to the checkout counter and the woman said, oh my God, you have a problem. And I said, yeah, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. <So. laughs> and tell, tell us how large this is. It's seven feet tall. Seven foot tall cross mm -hmm. filled with traps. Correct. Yeah, real, real traps. Real traps. Yes. They're not set. But. Yeah, but they're not set. So what statement are you saying? Uh, I, I really have a problem with organized religion and I have a problem with the way the evangelicals today are using their religion uh, to justify their hate mm. and their abuse. Mm. That pretty much sums it up. Wow, to justify their hate. Wow, um, that is so uh, amazing to see in person. I been there at your studio and was just like blown away um, and so I wondered what's next and it seems there's a theme of of, of justice uh, that permeates through your current work yes is that tell us about that it is um, I've, not only have I covered a lot of religious uh, subjects, but uh, abortion, gun violence. Uh, I've got one called Homegrown, which is about the neo-Nazis mm. coming out of the woodwork in our country. Um, mm. I did a Christmas tree shape out of rat traps, and I call it Oh Holy Right. Oh. And it's got a copper star on the top of it. So. Wow. 
So there, there's a little humor to this yeah. when you put the name on your work. Yeah, I try to have some humor. Um, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, a friend that I haven't seen before COVID came to the house and I was showing him the work and he looked at me and he said, you're really dark. And I said, well, yeah, I guess I am to a point, but you know, I'm taking that darkness out of me and I'm putting it into the art. I'm hanging it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I know on a personal note, when COVID hit, um, it affected many people and you kind of had a depression. I did. And uh, you mentioned that it was very healing for you is little micro doses of psilocybin Correct. mushroom. Right. I guess extract. And that it, it really helped you as an artist get back that creative, that spark. It did because I, uh, I retired. And at that point you go, okay, what am I going to do for the last phase of my life? Mm. And, uh, and then COVID hit and then I just, I just felt dead inside and depressed. Mm -hmm. And a friend asked me to go on a retreat mm -hmm. where we did psilocybin. And uh, then I started microdosing like three or four days a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really changed my outlook on things. And it really jump-started my creativity, which wow. I had really lost for a while. So, wow. Yeah. And that, that's got a, that's depressing when you're an artist and, and you know, that spark isn't there. Um, so it's wonderful that you found a way to rejuvenate that, that part of yeah. your brain. It's a miracle. <laughs> yeah, it's a miracle. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and indeed, looking at your artwork, who would even think of mousetraps? Uh, it's, it's just so, but I get it. Uh, that's the, the fun thing. And I hope that someday, um, I've been to your home gallery, but I'm hoping that someday after people see this, that they, they will have an opportunity to see it live. I mean, we can look at all the pictures, but to actually see your work in a studio would be a wonderful thing. And I, I think at this point in time, there's you don't have a place for it yet. I do not. I have uh, shown it to a few galleries, but I think they're a little hesitant about showing the work. And I don't think mm -hmm. it's because they don't think it's worthy, but mm -hmm. you know, it could be the environment of this, yeah. this area. And also, you know, uh, the gallery business is hard. And you've right. got to, I don't know if my work is marketable in this mm -hmm. part of the world, so. Yes, wow. Well, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Stay thank tuned. You. I hope soon you can see Bill Brim's work uh, other than on this show. And uh, thank you. How is that? Much better than I thought. I told you. <laughs> Wait till you see it. <laughs>